Yo, partnership alert, partnership alert, partnership alert. Living Corporate has a partnership with LinkedIn Learning, an American massive open online course provider that provides video courses taught by industry experts across a wide array of subjects. Now, the partnership is because Living Corporate has courses on LinkedIn Learning focused on diversity, equity, inclusion for leaders, career professionals, and anyone really looking to upskill themselves and be better allies. So make sure you check out our courses on LinkedIn Learning by clicking the link in the show notes. And let's just say you don't want to do that. You go to LinkedIn Learning on LinkedIn, search Live in Corporate. We'll be right there. All right. Peace. What's up, y'all? It's Zach with Living Corporate, and yo, happy Black History Month. Shout out to all the black folks around the world, the African diaspora at large, as well as um, our our American descendants of slavery. Shout out to us uh, for being resilient, for being strong, for being brave, for being courageous, for being vulnerable, for being human. You know, I continue to talk about um our contributions right i mean it's interesting i grew up and like a lot of folks i was told that george washington carver invented peanut butter right um and it wasn't until i got older that i realized how deep black contributions were to every facet of our society right from healthcare to science to automotives to cuisine to art to music to literature, you know, to literally everything, fashion, right? Like literally every aspect of life, um, black toys, video games, voice acting, (laughs) sitcoms, comedy, opera, dance. Like there's literally nothing that we haven't had our direct fingerprints on. Um, I'm so thankful to be black. I'm thankful to be here this Black History Month to talk about us, right? To celebrate us. You know, I I don't think it can be understated how our resilience continues to keep the world spinning. Um, to that end, I'm really excited about the guest that we have for y'all today. Menda Hearts. Menda Hearts, you know, I love the fact that, you know, Menda was on the podcast way before she was big right before she was a name um she was just on the pod talking about her book her first book and so we talk a bit about her journey we talk about her experience we talk about her perspective and the landscape as she sees it from a diverse equity and inclusion perspective particularly uh, the experience of black women so we talk about that and i just find our discussion so refreshing you know minda Minda's the homie, right? Like, I'm really excited about y'all checking out this conversation. And so before we get there, we're going to tap in with Tristan. What's going on, Living Corporate? It's Tristan, and I want to thank you for tapping back in with me as I provide some tips and advice for professionals. Today, let's discuss five signs that it's time for a new job. The beginning of a new year is often associated with brand new beginnings, a fresh start. The turning of the calendar year offers a renewed perspective and many of us start thinking about our careers. But the new year shouldn't be the only factor or motivator when it comes to making career decisions. So I wanna take a moment to discuss five signs that it might be time for a new job. First, your career development is stagnant. If it's been a while since you've learned something new or been challenged at work and you find yourself bored, it might be time for a new job. You shouldn't feel like you're just going through the motions. If you find yourself in this spot, before you decide to leave your current company, have a conversation with your boss. There might be new responsibilities you can take on with your current employer that will reignite your passion and enthusiasm for work. Second, your company is heading in the wrong direction. The pandemic has affected many companies operationally and financially. Some companies are conducting reorganizations or going through acquisitions that may lead to entirely new leadership. Other companies are changing their remote work policies, and some are just not doing well financially. Trust your intuition. If you don't like where the company is headed, jump ship. 
unless of course you're under contract. Third, you absolutely hate going to work. Now, don't get me wrong, I don't think you will be back flipping into work anywhere, but if work gives you anxiety and you dread going in, there's a problem. So, if your job negatively impacts your mental health and emotional well-being that much, you should probably find something new. Fourth, you're getting approached about new opportunities. Often the first thing that comes to mind when we talk about the search for a job is what if I don't land any interviews or offers? This thought alone may keep us in our current position because the security and predictability provides us comfort. But the good news is that according to the Society for Human Resources Management, we're in a candidate-driven market, which means that companies are competing to recruit talent. If you're already getting approached by recruiters or hiring managers, then that's a sign that you have in-demand skills and you may even be overqualified for your current role. Lastly, you're just ready for change. While all of your career decisions should be logical and well thought out, sometimes the only reason you need to find a new role is that you're ready for a new challenge and fresh start. There's nothing wrong with that. Just don't make a totally uninformed jump. This tip was brought to you by Tristan of Layfield Resume Consulting. Check us out on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Layfield Resume, or connect with me, Tristan Layfield, on LinkedIn. Minda, welcome back to the show. How's it going? Good to see you, Zach. Um, it's going good. I can't complain. Minda, you know, it's like every time you come back, it's like you bigger than the last time. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I feel like there's a Drake lyric in there somewhere. For you me, you so. kind of <laughs> like, you low key kind of like that, like that You Don't Know song by Jay Z. It's like one yeah, million, two yeah. million, three million, four. 16 I, months. I'm receiving that. I'm receiving that. <laughs> yeah, Lee. I remember when, like, I remember the first time you was on Living Corporate. Yeah, this was like right before see that you were like just trying to like get people to like check out seat at the table like it wasn't even like whatever you know this is way before the verification sticker you know what i mean <laughs> yeah way before when i just wanted people to say like hey i'm waving the flag like look over here like check this out you know um but it is a blessing for sure you a whole author now yes i am i'm leaning into that i, I it took me a while to accept that that is a title of mine that I, a one title that I carry and, and I'm proud of that work. So I, I own that, that title. Now, you know, I, you know, of course, of course we, we punch this in. I do the intro before we just kind of, this is the record. We just jump into the interview, but you know, um, it's incredible. Cause I knew, first of all, you've been, you've been that person for a minute, but the grill, like, let's talk about this grill. Like what inspired the bottom grill? Um, and, and and like, you know, what's the story behind that? Yeah, you know, uh, I think it's like a kid growing up in like the 80s and 90s. Um, you love hip hop, right? At least many black kids, right? And I always loved seeing my aunties with their gold in their mouth when I was growing up, you know, because on my mom's side, they're from New Orleans. So all of my great aunts, they'd have like one gold like outline on one of their tooth when we'd go to like function, I'd be like, she's a bad chick, you know? <laughs> and so I always had this, like, I'm like, when I get her age, I'm going to get some gold. And then once I got their age, I was like, oh, can't wear gold to my corporate job. Right. And then I just started to think about authenticity and, um, and how, even when I was in college, you know, Paul Wall and all of those, those real songs. And I thought, you know, it'd be kind of fun to, to tap into this thing that I've always wanted to get. And because now they're a little more fun than just that one gold tooth that my aunties used to have. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to go for it. And, um, and I, I actually like it. It's a vibe, Zach. <laughs> it's a vibe. You look great. You know what I'm saying? Thank I was you. like, I said, I said, this is a flex. I, when I saw it, I was like, that is so, so dope. So now look, you know, I'm interviewing you. It's the top of the year in 2022. Last year was like a lot of just, just a lot of stuff happened, right? Like it was frankly chaotic um, for a lot of different people. I I'm curious, like what, what things became clear for Minda in 2021? Yeah, that's a good way to describe it. I mean, you know, we, we see what we see on people's social pages, but 2021 was a hard year personally for me. Um, I was dealing with a lot of like mental health issues. and um, But what became really clear to me was um, 
that the that all of this is bigger than me and what do I want to leave behind who's going to be a beneficiary of my courage and I can't stop doing the work because I may not feel up to it today right like our ancestors and our elders they didn't st they were tired all the time but they knew that you and I would benefit from their work right and so what became really important to me was to double down on the things that I'm that I know are true, being a black woman in the workplace and be unapologetic about that. Regardless, if people get with it, cool. Uh, the, if they don't, then this is not for them. And we're going to rock with those who are who are with the cause. You know, it's it's I, I think that like what what your journey has continued to affirm for me is that um, there's so much work to do still. Um, and centering and amplifying uh, black and brown women's experiences um, and that the gap um, of just the equity gap is very, very, very broad. And uh, that, you know, that the experiences of all women of color are not the same, right? That, that black women have unique experiences. Um, Latin, Hispanic, Latinx women have unique experience. South Asian women have unique experiences. I'm curious, like, have you had to like, you know, in, in this journey from a seat at the table to, you know, to write within, like, have you had any type of like reminders that, Hey, look like, yes, women of color, but also like there are unique experiences for black women. Like, have you had any, has anything kind of refreshed you in that regard that like, Hey, actually all these experiences are not the same. Yeah, I, I have, um, you know, <laughs> two things can be true at the same time. We can all be women in the workplace and experience that workplace very differently. And, Many of us can be oppressed, but again, our access to privilege is a little different than, than others. And when I wrote Right Within, I was really, really intentional to say, I write for Black women, but also I know that there's not a lot of content and a lot of voices that are amplified in the way that mine might be right now. So I'm going to add, I'm going to add women of color to this as well, because I want them to feel seen in the work that I do, but I speak from a black woman's perspective. I speak culturally to black women, but there are other women of color who feel a connection to, to black women and to that marginalized experience. And so I want people to feel like they have a seat at my table. And um, I hope that the work that I'm doing and the work that you're doing and others will just show that there's work to do for all intersections, all, all areas of ethnicities. You know, it's curious, you know, when you talk about your first book, the, the Seat at the Table to Right Within, um, you know, healing from how to heal from racialized trauma and the racial trauma in the workplace. Like, what was your journey in like in 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 crafting and writing Right Within? Like, did you have to, you know, did you did you talk to different mental health experts? Like, you know, what did it look like? Did you have to go through any type of um, healing or therapy of your own. Like, talk to me about that journey to like really put that book together. Yeah. Um, you know, it's funny when I wrote the memo, uh, I thought, okay, well, this was the, my first book, Zach, I thought this was going to be like it. I've said what I've said. And what I realized after that was that even though we've experienced these inequalities in the workplace, we still hold on to the trauma of those experiences. And I thought about my own experiences. So, you know, even though whatever happened five years ago, 10 years ago, I, it still feels like it happened yesterday because I still sometimes hold on to those cuts. I still see those invisible cuts are the ones that hurt the most sometimes, right? And what I found was that even if our colleagues get the unconscious bias training, they get the whatever trainings, um, our healing cannot be tied to that. Like we have to figure out what is it that we need to release ourselves from this racialized aggression that we never should have been exposed to, but we're taking it into our lives. We're taking it home with us. Our partners, our kids, the people we love, they get this wounded version of us and we don't even know what the healthiest version of ourself is. And when I was in corporate America, I started on that journey to healing. I started seeing a therapist and I didn't realize that I was experiencing anxiety, depression, um, a host of other issues because of the work environment that I was in. I just thought it was me. I thought I was just going crazy, right? But it actually had to do with this environment, which was traumatic and it was, my body was reacting. And so I talked about my journey to healing. I'm not healed. I say healing is not a one-time event. It's a lifestyle. I commit to that practice every day. 
and I talk to faith healers in, in Right Within. I talk to therapists. I have some frameworks that help me continue to help me because again, it's the maintenance, right? We may still be working in toxic environments, but we can still heal while in hell. Ooh, come on now. Come on now. Heal while in hell. Yes. All right now. Um, mm, that's a word. Hold on, pause. Sound man, put a <laughs> put a flex bomb or something right there. Drop that. All right. You'll get that in post. It'll be great, man. You'll check. <laughs> um, so now let's talk a little bit about, you know, this this next book, right? You know, you are more than magic. Um, the black and brown girls guide. The black and brown girls guide to finding your voice. Like, mm-hmm. I, I it. So it's interesting as I look at the as I look at the books. It seems as if, like, um, the 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 vo- the your voice seems to grow bolder with each publication. Um, and frankly, a bit more nuanced and even like intentional at the same time. Like, talk to me about the story behind this book. And it releases on April 5th, 2022. Put the link in the show notes so it can pre order. But, like, talk to me about the journey to write this particular book. Yeah. You know, I thought about just the journey of being a black girl to being coming a black woman. And I used to think, oh, <clears throat> I was experiencing these things, imposter syndrome maybe scared to say my piece when somebody has offended me in the workplace. And I had to go back, Zach, and say, you know what? This didn't just happen when I entered corporate America. I was becoming this person because of some of the experiences I had as a teenager, junior high school, right? Being one of the only black kids at predominantly all of the schools I had went to growing up. And so I started to, to shrink myself. I started to code switch in ways that I didn't even know I might have been doing. I started to see myself through the eyes of white people instead of seeing them through seeing myself. Right. Um, and so I really, and so we take those versions of ourselves and we bring it to corporate, corporate America. And I wanted to say, you know what, wait, let's get back in the DeLorean, go back to the future. And if we could talk to our 13 and 14 year old selves, our 16 year old selves, what, what would they need to know so that when they get to corporate or they get to nonprofit and get their first job, they already have the tools to show up and know they belong in every space they're in. And if they do come across difficult personalities, then they have the understanding to have a dialogue to have to, to either rectify it, uh, create a solution with this person or move on. But I don't want them to wait till they're 30 years old to say, I have agency. I want you to learn how to have it now. You know, so a couple things, you know, the first, of course, all of this resonates. You're talking, you're talking to Zach and living corporate. Clearly all the things you're talking about resonate with me. But like the thing of what I, what I hear and what really I relate to is this idea of, you know, understanding that it's not even just the workplace, but like we were black and brown folks, black folks in this particular context, we're conditioned to limit, hide, kind of put our light under a bushel, so to speak. Um, and to question and doubt ourselves, right? And I think that, like, um, man, that's so, it's just, it's so true. Like, the, and like the, the trauma that comes from being silenced, like, throughout your life, uh, including in the workplace, it just compounds over time mm-hmm. to the point where, like, you can look up, you'd be 37, 38, 52 years old, 57 years old, 65 years old, and you've never actually, like, fully come to grips with like what who you are what your voice is you don't even recognize yourself you know what i mean and like it's so critical right like i've had conversations with folks um you know and i've and i like with people of all ages but like it's sad to me like when i meet people even like my my parents and i will have conversations i'm like man you know you don't have to deal with that like you can just tell them no like hell no you know what i'm saying like you you grown (laughs) You know what I mean? And so that that last point you said around, like, man, you don't want to be 30 waiting, you know, just coming into your voice. It's like because you think about like all of the um, all of the, you know, and not to be more, but your life is short. Life is so short and it's fragile. Right. And so, you know, all the opportunities you could have missed or all the all the all the indignity you suffered or all the Mm -hmm. whatever that you just kind of that that just have passed over. You can't get those moments back. You can't get that time back. Um. And then lastly, I'll say, you know, is the this idea around like therapy and like really understanding who 
what you know the impact of these things on your life like that's so critical i think about for me like the past like three years um and you know i've been i've been in therapy for some years and like really getting clarity for me on like yo no i actually have ptsd and anxiety and depression and i'm bipolar like I, there's all these challenges right that like that i've had either from just genetically as a kid but that have been like exponentially exacerbated as a result of racially traumatic work contexts and environments. Right. And so, you know, um, now look, you know, you're always, you everywhere, right. I'm not going to put your, your geo out here right now. You know I'm saying we mm-hmm. talked off mic about where you at right now, but I'm just saying mm-hmm. like you all over the place. Um, you're having conversations, you know what I mean? Hung out with, um, who was that? Uh, Oprah last week, you're talking to Barack <laughs> and Michelle tomorrow. Um, you're meeting with, you know, Megan Markle, like, so, Cardi B and them. So I'm, I'm curious, like, what's your, as you look at the landscape um, of, of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and of this space, like, do you have concerns about the long-term viability of this? Do you feel as if this is like, do you feel like, you know, this is still a movement? Do you think it's still a moment? Like, I'm curious, just like, as you look at the landscape, like, what are you seeing? Yeah, that's a great question, Zach. You know, I feel like we're at the intersection of either it was a moment or it's going to be a movement. I think we're at this really interesting place where it can still go either way. And I think voices like yours, voices like mine are trying to make sure it's not just a moment, right? But I, the things that I hear in the emails I still get from women who are experiencing really in their dignity being stripped away daily in these environments after the year of George Floyd, after all the conversations. And I'm like, y'all still showing up like this, still talking crazy to people, you know? So (laughs) I'm optimistic on one point, but it's going to take some revolutionary acts to really create that momentum. So it's no longer just having these conversations. We need some demonstration now. And I think a lot of black people in particular are fed up. And so I think some of these companies are going to have a hard time having us work there. So we're going to go to the ones or build our own that really show us that uh, racial justice is a core pillar here. And we're going to see, we don't need Glassdoor because we'll already know (laughs) that that ain't the place, right? And and, and they're going to have to deal with the consequences of that. And and I think that only in the next few years, I think we'll see who who the real true um, equitable, who are striving toward equity, because I know it takes a while, right? But those who are really trying to do something and those who are just going to keep talking about it. Now, again, right? I, your, your your growth has been inspiring. Like I said, it's like, I look, I'm like, dang, look, man, she just flexing again. There she is. There's she, that mama, there go that lady. That's it, what I do. That's what I say. I can't, I text, I, look, I nudge Can, Candace, my wife next, I, t- I pick up Emery. I'm like, Emery, look at the Twitter. Look at what, it, look at what, Look at what men to do. Now, let's talk a little bit about your production company. Like, what what is that about? Like, um, and what inspired that? And then, like, what things are you excited about as you continue to build it? Yeah, I, I'm really excited about Queen of Hearts production. It's actually something that a lot of people don't know is before I ever started writing about women of color in the workplace, when I was younger, like in my teens and early 20s, I used to love to write plays and and scripts that was like fun for me just therapeutic and Mm -hmm. so i never ever saw myself doing either of the things i'm doing now but i liked it it was a creative outlet um and so once i did you know write these books and start building space i'm like i want to continue to tell the stories of black and brown women in the workplace but in a different medium you know i want to be able to bring them to to screens or documentaries. And so, um, again, not waiting for our seat at the table, but creating our own table and chairs. And so that's what I decided to do with uh, Queen of Hearts. And and our first, um, I don't know when this will air, but our first, my first pr- production will be uh, during Women's History Month. So I'm working really hard to to get something um, spun out for, for a little teaser. So you're going to be like Tyler Perry Studios, but with better wigs, though. Much better wigs. Much. Okay. <laughs> I, hope I, I hope I have the 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 career success of Tyler, but I'm definitely gonna make sure as a black woman who has you know I've never worn any lace fronts, but has worn wigs and other things. I definitely understand the importance of having a good hairpiece. One hundred percent. Oh yeah, well, yeah. Respect to the to the success and and like two things can be true, like you said earlier. Like you know, come yeah. on, like, we gotta do this. Um. So now, yes, and yeah. This look. This is airing on Tuesday, so you know what I mean. Um. I'm excited about. 
all of the things that you're doing, as you look at this year, um, and as you look at your own experiences of men to hearts, especially over the last, I'm going to say like three and a half, four years, like what are things that continue to give you hope? Yeah. Um, what really gives me hope is the impact, right? The impact, um, you know, I, I often say that I didn't realize that my voice was tied to somebody else's freedom. Mm. And when I get tired, Zach, or when I'm like uncertain of myself, I just say, remember who's waiting, who's going to be a beneficiary of this, Minda. And that's what keeps me going. And that's what gives me hope because the messages that I get, Zach, from even 60 year old women who are like, after reading one of your books, I had the courage to go and have a conversation or I had the courage to leave and find a new job or I had the courage to explore what healing looks like. That is a game changer in some people's lives, no, just giving themselves permission to investigate and interrogate what a better version of themselves could be unhurt and unharmed. And that gives me hope knowing that, you know, not any fame or fortune, but really the impact because that at the end of the day is priceless. Minda, man, thank you so much for just like being a guest. Thank you for all the work that you're doing. Y'all make sure you check out all of Minda's work. I'm clicking the link in the show notes. All right. I ain't going to rattle off the billion different things you're doing. I'm going to give you space, though. Um, any parting words or shout outs before we let you go? Oh, well, I just want to thank you for always pulling up and supporting me. I appreciate you as an ally, as a friend. And, um, you know, I am thinking of ways that I want to loop you into some of the things that I'm doing. I will follow up outside of that. But I truly appreciate your voice and your work and the way you show up. That's very important. Um, and you know, shout out to everybody who has just ever supported me or wished me well. I, I appreciate that because this work can be lonely um, and it can be frustrating, but it can be um, really rewarding. And the last thing that I'll say is I'm not rooting for everybody's success. I'm rooting for your healing. Because mm. if you're healed, then you're going to be successful. <laughs> huh? Hold on now. Come That's on, that. organs. Yes. Come on with your healing. Tambourines, okay? Come on healing. now. <laughs> hey. Put me in A-flat, uh, keys. That's incredible. Yes. And yes, also, you know what I'm saying? Shout out to everybody. Um, definitely supporting Minda. You know what I mean? I saw that little kerfuffle on Twitter. I was about to have to roll up, pull out the y'all. I mean, I ain't know what, what people was really trying to do. You know, I'm playing now. But I'm they wasn't. They, I don't think they knew what they were trying to do either. <laughs> <laughs> Talk to you soon. I'm looking forward to us connecting offline and uh, have a great week and take care of yourself. You too. Thank you so much. Peace. Yo, I want to thank Minda again. Thank you so much for being a guest. Shout out to you. Make sure you check out her books, like all the links in the show notes, pre-order, do your thing. And like, let's make sure that we support um, black women, right? Like, it's easy to kind of retweet, buy a book, you know what I'm saying? If you can, gift a book to somebody else, right? I'm excited about um, her work. I'm excited about her being um, a guest in the future as well. So, um, look, this has been Zach with Living Corporate. Thank you so much for all your support. Make sure you check us out on Apple Podcasts. Give us five stars. Check out our merch. Check out our learning content on LinkedIn Learning. Until next time, y'all. Peace. Living Corporate is a podcast by Living Corporate LLC. Our logo was designed by David Dawkins. Our theme music was produced by Ken Brown. Additional music production by Antoine Franklin for Musical Elevation. Post-production is handled by Jeremy Jackson. Got a topic suggestion? Email us at livingcorporatepodcast at gmail.com. You can find us online on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and living-corporate.com. Thanks for listening. Stay tuned.